So welcome back. Okay, now we have uh, this is the second session of the afternoon. So we have three more speakers today before the the evening session that will conclude our event. So uh, now I'm going to introduce uh, Eric Sampson with his paper "Effective Altruism: Disaster Prevention and the Possibility of Health." Eric, are you here? Uh, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hey. Um... I've got a handout here. I, I thought I was going the second in this round, so I wasn't quite ready. But I, I mean, I can I can go. Um, let me uh, drop in the chat my handout. So there's a link to the handout that I'm going to be uh, presenting, and then I will try to share a handout with you on the screen as well. Can you see the handout I've just shared? Perfectly. Great. Um, okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Eric uh, Sampson, and I'm a postdoc at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. And this is a talk about uh, the intersection of um, ethics and philosophy of religion. So this is a talk about effective altruism. So I've got 20 minutes. Let me go ahead and put uh, 20 minutes on the clock so I make sure that I have you know much more than 20 minutes worth of things to say. But okay, uh, so. Let me say something about what effective altruism is. I suspect many of you know already about the nature of effective altruism, but um, basically it's a movement to try to do the most good that you possibly can. So uh, effective altruists have tons of websites, but one that's pretty popular with them is this uh, website called Giving What We Can, where the goal is to uh, help people think about how to give the most money that they can for the most effective uh, charities that they can. So there, when you add uh, to their, their answer to... Um, the question, what is effective altruism, is this. Effective altruism is the project of using evidence and reason to figure out how to best contribute to helping others and taking action on that basis. So uh, the effective altruism movement is inspired by lots of uh, consequentialists, people who think that the rightness or wrongness of your action depends on the consequences that it brings about. And the people that they're inspired by are primarily Peter Singer, who is a well-known utilitarian. Uh, Singer has this famous article called um, uh, famine, affluence, and morality, where he argues that we all uh, have extensive duties to give money to the global poor um, on the on the assumption that we are significantly richer than uh, the global poor and many people uh, in developed countries and probably anyone who studies philosophy, anyone in this uh, in this Microsoft Teams uh, meeting probably has that sort of money. And so uh, he thinks that they have an extension, extensive obligations to help the poor. Um, and that paper sort of gave rise to this general movement, which is now associated with Will McCaskill and Toby Ord and Nick Bostrom. These are philosophers at uh, Oxford and Cambridge. And they have tons of um, organizations that are all devoted to doing the most good you possibly can. Things like the Giving What We Can uh, organization, 80,000 Hours, the Center for Effective Altruism, GiveWell, which is a, a charity uh, evaluator, evaluates how effective each dollar that you give is. So we could go on and on, but there are lots of uh, these organizations, many of them housed in, uh, in London or Oxford or Cambridge. Um, and what they, uh, the tools that they have at their disposal are things like quality adjusted life years, which are often called quality qualities or cost benefit analysis or expected value maximization. In other words, they take a very scientific approach to maximizing good consequences. And the old school concern that effective altruists have had was uh, global poverty relief, as I've just said, giving to, uh, to people in less developed countries and factory farming. So alleviating the suffering of animals in factory farms. And the justification that they had for tackling those problems was that that was the best way to do the most good that they possibly could. But upon reflection, um, effective altruists have had this, this new emphasis, and that is existential risk and the future of humanity. So here the thought is, um, they've sort of, after reflection, realized that, oh man, we have this huge amount of time ahead of us, millions or billions of years. And during that time, we can realize just tons and tons of value. So. Uh, we've been on, if you just think about humanity, we had very we had you know almost no technology at all at our beginning, and slowly we've developed more and more technology. The lifespan of a human being is like twice what it was just 200 years ago. It looks like we're on track to make life significantly better for people on the whole. And if that trend continues, we have this opportunity to have to give just enormously high quality of life to every human being that lives, as long as we don't destroy ourselves. Now, if we destroy ourselves, we will extinguish all possibility for all that value that we could recognize, that we could realize. And so their thought is we have to be very careful about not destroying ourselves in this time that we have now, which is in some ways a unique time. We have the ability to kill every single human on the on the planet with things like nuclear war or runaway um, artificial intelligence that, you know, um, that 
well, there's a whole book by Nick Bostrom called Super Intelligence, where he goes through all the ways that artificial intelligence could become enormously powerful and kill every human um, on the planet. Or global pandemics could kill us, engineered pandemics, or or just natural pandemics, or um, runaway climate change. There are a million, there are lots of ways that we could destroy ourselves, and these are opportunities that we have to destroy ourselves that we didn't have just 200 years ago because we just didn't have that kind of technology. So, what effective altruists think is we're in a very special time in the history of humanity where it's crucial that we don't destroy ourselves because there's so much value to be realized in our future. Okay, so that change in perspective has been called uh, long-termism. So long-termists think that we should think more about the long-term since the potential for promoting value over such th that vast stretch of time is unimaginably greater than even the great gains in value to be achieved by alleviating poverty in the present. Long-termists say, we should really look to the distant future and think about how we can secure all the value that stands to be realized in the distant future. Now you might say, hey, look, all this worry about existential risk, things like you know runaway climate change or killer AI or nuclear winter, each of those risks individually, if you, if you just look at them individually, they're less, it's more likely that they won't occur than that they do occur. Um, so how have I said that? For each risk, the probability that they'll occur is tiny, so why worry about them? And the reply from the effective altruist is that's right, for each existential risk, it's unlikely that it will, it will occur. But if it occurs, it would be an unbelievable disaster. And so that means that even now, we have excellent reasons to devote intellectual and monetary resources, that is money, to the mitigation of these risks, even though the probability of their occurrence is vanishingly small. In other words, uh, they take the attitude towards existential risk that many of you, us take towards things in our ordinary life. Like, for instance, many of us probably lock our doors is that because it's likely that we're going to be robbed if we don't lock our doors? No, actually, it's it's more probable that we won't uh, be robbed even if we don't lock our doors. But we go ahead and we pay the cost of locking the door. It's a little bit of an inconvenience to prevent a disaster, which is somebody breaking in and stealing all our stuff. And we put on our seatbelt, not because it's probable that we'll get in a wreck for any time for any given time that we get in the car. We pay that small cost to avoid a disaster. If we did get in a car wreck, having a seatbelt on would save our life. And we buy insurance for all these same reasons. That's a perfectly rational thing to do, to pay a cost that you almost certainly will lose to prevent a disaster. That's how um, effective altruists think about existential risk. So what I want to do in this talk uh, is just say this. I want to um, say, hey, effective altruists, you're, you're thinking on the right track, but you've missed this crucial thing that you should be worrying about if you're worried about existential risks. So my goal is to identify a new existential threat that has uh, the same important features of the standard existential risks. And I call that risk religious catastrophe. So what is religious catastrophe? What is this threat that looms that effective altruists haven't been paying attention to? It's the threat that billions or trillions of people are uh, might be going to hell or something like hell for all eternity for rejecting God or the one true religion. Now, crucially, I'm not saying that like we know for a fact that people are going to hell. No, I don't have any idea if people are going to hell or not. Um, but the thought is, as if there's anything close to a probability in the vicinity of the standard existential risks that people go to hell. So even a tiny risk, then that should be something that we're concerned about and that we're willing to expend some resources to, to try to prevent. So that's the first thing I want to uh, identify, religious catastrophe. I want to argue that even secular effective altruists, that is even staunch atheists, uh, ought to uh, think that religious catastrophe is at least as bad and at least as probable and therefore at least as important as the biggest existential threats about which effective altruists standardly worry. And then I wanna argue that even staunchly secular effective altruists, that is staunchly atheist uh, effective altruists, by their own lights ought to devote significant intellectual and monetary resources to the mitigation of the risk of religious catastrophe. In other words, they ought to take the same measures that they take to mitigating religious catastrophe that they take towards you know, uh, mitigating the risk of uh, runaway artificial intelligence or volcanoes slamming into the earth and destroying all of humanity. These are all sorts of things that effective altruists worry. I say, if you're worried about those things, all those things that make you worried about those, about um, things like asteroids hitting us or artificial intelligence destroying us, all those features are present in the case of religious catastrophe. So you should worry about those things too. Now you might think, that's totally bizarre. That you think that uh, that effective altruists, secular effective altruists, ought to do things like supporting researchers and institutes and encouraging donations for the project of promoting religious belief. And the answer is, yeah, I actually think that they should do that uh, by their own lights. And that may sound bizarre, but effective altruists are known for accepting 
what many regard as bizarre conclusions that just follow straightforwardly from their principles. So one really bizarre practice that effective altruists think we should do is um, that we should uh, release lots of iron shavings into the ocean. And what would that do? That would cause lots of foam in the ocean, which, is, which has sort of a white uh, color. And the reason that's important is because that would cause lots of that would cause sunlight to be reflected back into the atmosphere, and it would not be absorbed uh, and uh, by the by the Earth. And so basically, what I want to say is, if you're worried about artificial intelligence killing us, or runaway climate change, or global pandemics killing us all, or uh, super volcanoes exploding, or nuclear war, you should also worry about religious catastrophe. Okay, so. Um, there's a section in the paper where I just characterize, like, as a matter of fact, lots of people have been telling us that there is this, there is such a thing as religious catastrophe. Are they right about that? Hard to say, but at least it's uh, there's a non-zero chance that they're right about this. So here's just Jesus in the um, in the New Testament, sort of alerting us to the fact that there might be um, something like a religious catastrophe, uh, at least the threat of it. So this is the sheep and the goats passage in Matthew 25. So. I won't read it all, but basically he he tells the story of the sheep and the goats. The sheep are the people who follow Jesus and do the right things, and they're going to be, you know, uh, they're going to be with Jesus forever. And then he will say to them, "This is Jesus. Depart from me, you cursed." This this is what he says to the goats, the non-believers. Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food, and I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink, and all that stuff. Truly, I say to you, says Jesus, as you did not do it to one of the least of these. You did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So there's the New Testament saying, there's the threat of religious catastrophe. The Quran has the same, the Quran has the same sorts of warnings here. I won't read them all, but you just see in bold here that the, the Quran warns that uh, there's this fire whose fuel is men and stones, which is prepared for those who reject the faith. Those who deny their Lord over their heads will be poured out boiling water and so on. It's, it's going to be very bad. Okay, so I take it that you know that many religious um, uh, traditions have this doctrine of hell, according to which those who don't believe or don't do the right things will be in big, big trouble. Okay, if, that ha if that's true, that would be very, very bad. How bad would it be? So what I'm going to do now is just think about, well, let's compare the badness of religious catastrophe to the badness of the standard existential risks about which effective altruists typically worry. And then let's think about the probability uh, of religious catastrophe relative to the probability of the standard existential risks. And what I want to argue is that religious catastrophe is as bad or worse than the standard existential risk and as probable or more probable than the standard existential risk, which means that it's as important or more important than the standard um, existential risks about which effective altruists typically worry. Okay, so let's start with the badness of um, religious catastrophe. How catastrophic would it be? Well, I, th I claim that religious catastrophe is at least as bad as the worst existential risks. There's two ways to argue for this. One, argue, one way to argue for this is just a one-shot, finite versus infinite sort of argument, and here's what I have in mind. For each existential risk, its disvalue is finite. It's a finite number of people will die, and a finite number of people will be prevented from enjoying valuable life. Because it's not as though on the atheistic worldview, uh, there's just an infinite n amount of people that will come into existence. At some point, the universe will die, what's called a heat death, which is just where all the matter and energy is dispersed equally um, around the universe, and there just is no possibility for life anymore. So even if AI did take over and kill us all, or even if we did have runaway climate change that killed us all, it would still extinguish a finite amount of value. But if religious catastrophe happens, and there is something like an eternal hell, then its disvalue is, is infinite. It goes on forever and ever and ever. And what people miss out on, uh, heaven for all eternity, uh, that's infinite, and that's what they miss out on. So uh, if religious catastrophe does in fact occur, then uh, its disvalue is either infinite or finite, but ever increasing because it lasts for all eternity. So its disvalue is far greater than the disvalue of any of the existential threats. That's sort of a one-size-fits-all argument. Take any particular existential risk that you're worried about. It's finitely bad and take religious catastrophe. If it were to occur, it would be infinitely bad. Another thing you could do is just argue piecemeal, which is just sort of think about, suppose that there's eternal hell for billions or trillions of people. Think about how bad that is. Now think about runaway climate change that, it, that kills every single human being. How bad would that be? I hope it's just apparent to you upon the consideration of those two possibilities that eternal hell for billions or trillions of people is worse. And you can do that for all of the standard existential risks, nuclear war, killer AI, pandemics, 
asteroids colliding into the earth, all that stuff. I take it that eternal hell is going to win the badness uh, standoff every time because eternal hell is much worse. Okay, so that's just supposed to say uh, religious catastrophe is at least as bad and maybe worse than all the standard existential risk. But what about the probability? Because here's one thing you could say, yeah, 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 I agree that if there were a religious catastrophe, it would be really bad, worse than standard existential risk, but it's so improbable that we can just ignore it. So now what I want to argue is that the probability of religious catastrophe is at least in the vicinity of the standard existential risk. So in order to substantiate that claim, we need to know, well, how probable are the standard existential risks? And in the sort of go-to book for effective altruists on uh, existential risk, there's this book called The Precipice, written by Toby Ord, who's one of the founders of the existential uh, or of the um, effective altruist movement. And he gives his own um, assessment of the probabilities of all the standard existential risks. And here, if you can see on my screen, these are his estimates for how probable it would be that in the next hundred years, one of these catastrophes does in fact befall us. So you can see an asteroid or a comet impact, one in a million. Now he thinks there's a one in a million chance that an asteroid or a comic comet will hit the, the earth, destroying all human life. And yet he thinks that it's the kind of thing that we should worry about and we should devote resources to mitigating the risk that that would happen. So we should search the skies for those comets. And if we find them, we should devote resources to breaking up that asteroid or in some way deflecting it and redirecting it away from us. And so on for all these super volcano eruption. This is this would be if a massive volcano. I mean, we're not talking about a standard volcano. A massive volcano erupts. It pushes tons of uh, ash into the sky blotting out the sun because it, if, if it did that it would be above the clouds so it can you couldn't rain out the ash so if you have all this ash above the clouds it's going to blot out the sun which would cause terrible crop failure starvation social unrest and and destroy us all he thinks there's a one in ten thousand chance that that'll happen in the next hundred years and he thinks we should devote resources to working out if that's going to happen and if so ways we can mitigate the damage that would be suffered if that did happen, and so on for all of these. The point I just want to point out is that a lot of these are very, very, very low probabilities, and yet the effective altruists think these are things we should worry about and devote resources to. Okay, so I think the one that has the what he regards as the highest probability is unaligned artificial intelligence. This is we have artificial intelligence so powerful, and its priorities are unaligned with ours. That is, it you know wants to complete certain tasks that require that it kill us. And it, if it's powerful enough, it will in fact do that. He, he regards that as uh, having a one in 10 chance. Okay, but the point is that all these existential risks are pretty low in terms of their probability. Now let's think about what's the probability of religious catastrophe. Well, I wanna suggest that it's higher than one in 10,000 or one in 1 billion or um, one in a thousand even. What exactly is the probability? I don't know, but I would just wanna say it's, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of like 5% or higher. Um, and if that's true, then it's the kind of thing we should really worry about. Maybe if it's even 1% or higher, then um, it's worth worrying about. Okay, so here are just some considerations bearing on the probability that some religion like Christianity or Islam or Judaism or some, some version of, of religion that has heaven and hell type stakes is true. So you have all the standard natural theological arguments. Look, I don't think anybody regards those arguments as conclusive, as showing for sure that God exists, but they offer some evidence that there is such a being as God uh, and that there's the kind that might, um, you know, result in people going to hell. At least 57% of humans on this planet believe in, in, heaven, in heaven and hell type stakes religion. And actually probably more than that, I just included Christianity and Islam here, but there are others. So for instance, Buddhism on some versions, uh, if you reach Nirvana, you have something like a, a bliss-like stake. And if you don't, then you're going to live in, um, you know, it gets progressively worse and worse for you. I'm happy to include those sorts of religions uh, in the calculation here. Uh, literally millions of people over the ages have claimed to have religious experiences associated with these religions. Here's the what I take to be the most evidence. So professional philosophers are among the most skeptical groups of people on the planet. And yet, according to the 2009 field paper survey, 14% of them were theists. If we play it safe and suppose that only a third of those philosophers believe in hell, that means that about 5% of philosophers believe in hell. So on this very conservative estimate, about 5% of the most skeptical people on the planet believe in hell. When you look at that filled paper survey, 68.4% of respondents who specialize in philosophy of religion were theists. Um, so among the population most acquainted with the arguments for and against God's existence, most believe in God. Now, I, of course, understand that there's a selection effect here. That is, the kinds of people who are inclined to go into philosophy of religion are the kinds of people who think that there's something like a God, or at least that it, they're open to the suggestion that there is something like a God. So we'd have to sort of pull the numbers down in light of that selection effect. But all the same, 
The point is that the arguments against God's existence aren't so compelling that anybody who looks at them just immediately gives up belief in God. It's not as though uh, the arguments are so compelling that it just like rationally compels you to rule out the possibility of God's existence, which is what you would need to do to not worry about religious catastrophe. Uh, the last thing is like, what on earth could justify giving such a low probability, so low that we can ignore the possibility of religious catastrophe? What on earth could justify assigning such a low credence to something like Christianity or Islam? It looks like it's just philosophical arguments. And philosophical ar arguments are cool. So you have the ar argument from evil, argument from hiddenness, the evil God challenge, religious diversity. These are all good arguments against God's existence. But are they so good that they warrant having a credence in something like one in a million uh, that that some sort of religious catastrophe is possible? I think the answer is no. Okay, so um, I need to wrap up here, but you probably get the sense that what I'm arguing for here is something like uh, Pascal's Wager. That is, I think that um, Pascal's Wager basically just says, hey, you should try to get yourself to believe in God because the benefits of doing so would be enormously high. Um, and if if you believe in God and he's not there, no big deal. You just, a, you just bear a little bit of a cost. So um, there are. So you might think, oh, we can just pull all the objections to Pascal's wager and apply them here. I just want to say there are at least some of the objections to Pascal's wager that I can totally sidestep. One is just that a lot of people object to Pascal's wager because they can't just voluntarily believe in God. But on my view, you don't have to believe in God in order to give um, money to uh, the promotion of religious belief. Um, let me just go, because I'm basically out of time here. Let me just go to the biggest objection to Pascal's wager and how I would respond to it. Uh, in this case, this is the many gods objection. So um, I've said that uh, if if there is something like a, a hell, uh, according to some religion, then the the stakes are infinitely bad, or the disvalue of, of a religious catastrophe of that kind would be infinitely bad. And so you might think, oh, well, it's infinitely bad if Islam is true, infinitely bad if Christianity is true, infinitely bad if some version of Buddhism is true. So if they ha all have the same expected disvalue, then we don't have any reason to choose between all the different religions. And here, what I want to say to that is, actually, you do have a reason to choose one over another. That is, you should give to the, the cause that you regard as the most probable. So that's true that there may be lots of religions all having the same expected disvalue, but you should choose to give um, to the mitigation of the disaster associated with the religion you regard as most probable. That's what we already do with existential risk. There are many existential risks. Which one do we give the most resources to? Uh, when all things are equal, we give to the one we regard as most probable, and that's exactly what you would do in this case. Okay, let me conclude real quickly. So basically what I want to argue is that by effective altruists' own lights, they ought to devote resources to the mitigation of the risk of religious catastrophe, like giving money to missionaries to convert people to various religions to avoid religious catastrophe. And that just follows straightforwardly from their own principles. So th I, I take this as a choice point. Either they can say, Eric, you're right. This should be uh, just another one of our things that we worry about, another one of our existential risks that we devote time and resources to. Or they can say, no, Eric, the, that's crazy. The probability of um, religion is very low. But then I just want to say, uh, well, take the probability that you think religious catastrophe has. Anything that has that same probability, any of the standard existential risks that have that probability or less, you should also not worry about those. You can't discard religious catastrophe, but keep all of your standard existential risk, you have to get rid of those too if you want to get rid of religious catastrophe. Okay, I'll wrap it up there. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. So thanks, Eric. I can see there are already questions. Uh, uh, Charles? Professor Talia Ferro? Professor Nicolás, só pede para tirar do destaque, por favor. Ah, uh, Eric, can you stop the sharing of the oh, PowerPoint, please? Yeah. And there's a question for you by Professor Tagliaferro. Oh, I don't know. Other questions if uh, Professor Tagliaferro is having issues with his computer? I can begin. Please. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, uh, nice presentation, but uh, your line of argument. I don't know. I don't understand. You begin talk about altruism and after you talk about catastrophes and probabilities. Uh, maybe you can talk more because I don't know if I get your point really, you know. Uh, sure, yeah, I can say some stuff. Um... Oh, um, 
I don't know if you could see my my uh, screen during that time. Um, no. Oh, okay. Here I am. Sorry. I apparently had Zoom on too, which is uh, why no, you couldn't I see me. It's better. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, because I couldn't see myself either. Um, yeah. So you, you're like, what is your point? Yeah, the point is just this. There are these group of people, mostly utilitarians, who think that um, we ought to devote resources to uh, to trying to stop certain disasters from occurring. Things like um, runaway climate change or asteroids slamming into the Earth. That would be very, very bad if that happened. Okay. They think we ought to give resources to try to stop that. I say, but, hey. Sorry, oh, yeah, this is uh, a uh, go of altruism theory in Peter Singer, too? Uh, prevent yeah. catastrophes. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, I think altruism. It's uh, he talk only about uh, give money to persons need money. You know to stop the, <laughs> you know the vitamins of uh, in the poor. I think you can talk more about this. I mean. Sure. Yeah, it, it did begin as uh, so Peter Singer originally his thing was giving to the global poor and and alleviating the suffering of animals. Um, and then that gave a lot of people thought, hey, Peter Singer's on the right track. We should really worry about the consequences of our actions uh, and how that plays out practically. And then lots of other uh, utilitarians sort of took on that that sort of line of thinking and extended it to other domains of life. And they said, oh, well, if what we're interested in is bringing about the best consequences we possibly can, the best way to achieve that goal is to prevent ourselves from destroying ourselves because there's so much value that, that we could realize in the distant future. And we're in this pivot point for, huma for humanity where we can actually, we have the technology now to destroy ourselves. So the biggest thing we need to do is make sure we don't destroy ourselves in order to realize all the value that we have in, the, in humanity's future. Okay, so those th that group of people is called effective altruists. They're very much inspired by Peter Singer. And Peter Singer, though his main, though when he speaks publicly, he's mostly worried about global poverty and animals. He sort of signs on to all that stuff that the effective altruists say. What they say is we ought to devote resources to making sure we don't run into one of these huge catastrophes. And what I want to say is that's great. I think that line of reasoning is excellent. I think we definitely should worry about runaway climate change or artificial intelligence. Another thing we should worry about is the possibility that everyone goes to hell for all eternity. That's a danger that people have been warning us about for a long time. Maybe it's improbable, but basically every existential risk is improbable, and yet it's still worth devoting resources to stop that from occurring. And I'm saying the effective altruists are right. They've just missed this one crucial piece uh, and I, and my suspicion is that they missed it because they tend to be pretty secular. So they're just not even thinking about religious things at all. It's just not a concern of theirs, but I'm saying by their own lights, it ought to be a concern of theirs. Hey, thanks. We have a question from professor Taliaferro. Then I'm afraid that, uh, unfortunately, because, you know, it took, uh, Charles, professor Taliaferro. Thanks, Eric. No. Well, so thanks again for your interesting talk. Okay, 